Welcome to Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Shanali Basic in for Katie Greifeld. And I'm Scarlett Poo. Katie Greifeld flew south for the winter. Like the birds. Like, like the birds. birds. <laughs> nice to be with you here in New York, though. Likewise, let's get to the biggest stories right now in the more than $10 trillion global ETF industry, which means we go live to Miami to the exchange conference where leaders are discussing the future trends in ETF land. And in just a few minutes, we're going to speak to Sue Thompson of State Street Global Advisors as she announces her retirement after 20 years in the industry. And your chocolate may be more expensive this Valentine's Day as we look at an ETF that tracks a sweet commodity. Now, normally, we'd be bringing in Eric Bautunas to show us the flows, but he's one of the big shots attending that conference in Miami, so we're going to catch up with him later on. In the meantime, I will fill in as the Bautunas tribute band and go through the flows. All right, let's start with inflows because the big headline, of course, this past week was the S&P 500 breaching 5,000 for the first time ever, powered by big tech. So it follows that Qs and cheap beta lead the way, each attracting at least $1.6 billion in flows. We also see SPLG as another example of cheap beta. Also in the top five are two Bitcoin ETFs. You have iBit and FBDC. This is iShares and Fidelity. They've each attracted about $3 billion in inflows there as well. A couple of bond ETFs as well to tell you about. You have TLT and you have BND. We know that the U.S. Treasury auctioned off 10 and 30-year bonds that drew pretty decent demand. Let's go now to outflows because you'll see a familiar ticker here at the very top, and that is SPY. Uh, once again, SPY leading the way. Eric has been talking about tax loss harvesting after SPY really raked it in last year, especially in December. He called it less sentiment and more operationally driven. $3 billion in outflows right there. LQD, the investment grade bond ETF uh, credit, I should say, also in the number two slot. IWM, which is the Russell 2000 ETF, uh, should benefit from the evidence that the U.S. economy is holding up better than a lot of people expected, but investors don't seem convinced that small caps are the way to get there. And in the number seven spot, I want to point out IYR. This is the iShares U.S. real estate ETF seeing about half a billion dollars in outflows. CRE, Shanali, commercial real estate, continues to rear its ugly head here as a New York community bank provisioned for more bad loans than a lot of people had anticipated, and other banks are starting to mark to market some of their real estate loans. Trouble for some is opportunity for others. Thank you, Scarlett. And joining our conversation now is Sue Thompson, who leads ETF distribution in the Americas at State Street Global Advisors. And Sue, you just announced your retirement in the second quarter of 2024, but in your time at State Street, ETF assets more than doubled to $1.2 trillion. How do you see the firm collecting the next trillion dollars? You know, I think we've seen a trend over many years now of um, advisors especially being just very cost conscious. So I think the next wave of growth is going to continue to be uh, a lot more in low cost. We've already seen about 60% of flows go into low cost. And, uh, and I think we've done some very compelling uh, price cuts back in August that really position us well for the future. So I think that's a major trend. I think we're also, we've seen a trend now going on for quite some time around fixed income. I think uh, we're going to continue to see advisors choosing to go with fixed income. And then lastly, uh, I think one of the areas where I'd love to see some development would be in trying to um, get alternatives into, uh, into this ETF um, as a wrapper. I think that would be just a really great innovation for, uh, for the market. When you say alternatives, are you talking about um, mimicking alternative strategies or investing in private equity and the like? Well, private equity is very, very difficult to do, but I do think that there are a number of different strategies that actually, you know, if you're creative, that you could do in the form of an ETF. So I'd love to see us, um, I'd love to see the industry, but, but especially State Street, I'd love to see us do something there. You know, it's interesting, Sue, you're one of the rare, very rare people in the industry that has worked for the trifecta, BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street. When you think about where the battle is being fought on the ETF turf, what is the singular most competitive area right now? You know, I do think it's for those big beta blocks. I think the top three are got where they are because they have the large um, funds that advisors and in, end investors want um, in the major asset classes. So I still think that inexpensive beta uh, wins the day. However, that said, I do think that some of the more interesting things that we're starting to see um, are some of the active strategies. I think it's especially interesting in fixed income. And uh, I think that 
some of the things that uh, that we've worked on, whether it be SRLN with senior loans um, or partnering with Double Line on TOTL. I think we've seen some really interesting um, flows and, and interest from advisors for active fixed income strategies. That's interesting you say inexpensive betas, and we know that that's been obviously the theme across the ETF land, but you also know that active equity ETFs have made up about 50% of all equity flows, taking in a record $13 billion. What does that signal to you that active doing is doing better than passive uh, over the last couple of weeks? I mean, I think, I think from an active equity perspective, um, I, I think what we've seen is we've seen a couple of areas uh, that have been more uh, interest in very specific protecting on the downside kind of strategies. Mm. Um, that's really what's uh, attracted a lot of investment dollars. A lot of the dollars that you see going into active ETFs right now, you have to really distinguish whether it's you know real money or it's firms that have launched ETFs and are trying to encourage their advisors to go from their mutual fund lineup to their ETF lineup. And, you know, so you actually have to look at some of the firms and say, what is the totality of their flows? Because they could be showing great inflows on ETFs, but they're in outflows from the similar mutual fund. And to me, that's not that's not real new money in, into the ETF industry. It's pretty fascinating. When you look at the mutual fund complex here, you do see many of them even still uh, trying to break through in the ETF landscape. What do you think this all means for uh, competition moving forward? Are there too many ETF providers these days? Uh, and can they really compete with the giants like State Street? I think there's a lot of room still. When you think about uh, the the ETF industry, it seems incredible. We're at eight trillion dollars worldwide, but I still think that there's plenty of room to go, and I think that there's plenty of of place for competition. I do think that um, that good competition. It's it's like what they say: um, first competition makes you sick, and then it makes you better. <laughs> and uh, and so I'm always a big fan of of seeing really good competitors, because I do think that um, that's at the heartbeat of, of what we're trying to do in this industry, which is to continue to innovate. I want to get your take on model portfolios and how spot Bitcoin ETFs would fit into that, because obviously um, that's going to be a big driver of those flows when firms start to really look at which ground they'll give up to make room for Bitcoin ETFs. What have you seen and how far along in that evolution are we in uh, advisors and, and firms making that decision? Um, I think what we've seen, and, and listen, I'm just speaking from the advisors with whom I've personally spoken. Mm -hmm. And I think almost without exception, um, what they've said is they need a lot more education on the asset class uh, before they would feel comfortable putting it into a model. Um, so I think we're a little ways away from it being, from there being broader acceptance. Um, and most, most advisors that we talk with are more taking a wait and see approach. What is the big risk here? I mean, do you think that Bitcoin is just one asset of many assets? You were talking about alternatives a little earlier that create many more risks in the future as people look to create broad access to these products that are either more liquid or potentially unproven. I, I think it's one of those things where when you think about putting something in a model, what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to look at the correlations over time. Does this, is this actually going to serve as a true diversifier of the portfolio? And, and honestly, what we know at Bitcoin right now is it's, the, it's relatively short-lived in that, you know, you haven't seen Bitcoin throughout many market cycles. And so that makes those correlations, you know, hard to be able to predict in the future and thus the impact on the portfolio hard to predict. Sue, so we started off with Shanali saying that you're retiring soon, um, leaving State Street. What's next for you? I know that you're very active in women in ETFs. Are you going to stay involved in that? I will absolutely stay involved in women in ETFs. It's, um, as you know, I was a co-founder of that, and it remains uh, a place that's near and dear uh, to my heart. Beyond that, um, probably do some board work, some advisory work. Uh, but mostly, uh, I do intend to spend a great deal of time uh, with my two grandchildren. Enjoy it. Um, congratulations you. to you. Sue Thompson of State Street, really appreciate your taking the time to speak with us.
Coming up, we're going to head over to Miami, where the exchange conference is taking place, and check in on what industry leaders like Sue are discussing. That's next. This is ETFIQ on Bloomberg. Welcome back to ETF IQ. I'm Shanali Basik, and it's time now for the ETF Brief, where we highlight stories and trends that caught my eye. The U.S. spot Bitcoin ETF rollout has been arguably the most successful launch ever by any metric. Inflows haven't been underwhelming by historical standards, and BlackRock and Fidelity's ETF have taken in cash every single day, gathering more than $3 billion apiece. And it tops the industry's all-time list for assets after the first month. And at the offshore market, there's a different story going on. Investors just keep taking cash from U.S. listed ETFs tracking Chinese stocks. And despite hopes of stimulus measures from the world's second largest economy, more losses look likely. And I want to talk about another hot market, the Treasury market, because investors are weaning off Treasury ETFs after sinking more than $100 billion, a record, into them last year as they wait Fed actions and shift instead to corporate bonds, Scarlett. And I, I imagine all those themes are playing out at the exchange ETF conference taking place in Miami right now. Who else is there? Katie's there. Eric Bautunas is there. So let's check in with Eric of Bloomberg Intelligence. Eric, good to see you. Um, I know you arrived in Miami over the weekend. Um, is everyone talking about the spot Bitcoin ETF? I imagine that's top of the agenda. Yeah, for sure. I think digital assets, uh, no surprise. It's the shiny new object the new thing that everybody is sort of like excited about. Um, you know, two, three years ago, it was ESG. Five, seven years ago, it was smart beta. There's always something new that kind of captures everybody's imagination. It's like a new frontier. And, you know, the, the, the core of the portfolio, as Sue mentioned, that bulk beta is is largely had. You know, Vanguard and BlackRock and State Street are going to battle that out. You know, one basis point, two basis points cuts. It's There's not a lot going on there. Um, but the fight for stuff that can accent or complement that 60-40 is red hot. So whether it's the Bitcoin ETFs or uh, thematic ETFs, that's the area of the portfolio that a lot of the innovation is going to take place in. So that's where a lot of the product talk is. But there's also like some classic um, how to use ETFs in a portfolio, a lot of education that goes on here uh, in between some of the more like sexy panels on Bitcoin and whatnot. So um, it's a, you know, the conference has evolved over the years. Um, and it's getting a little more more just full of Wall Street firms, too. That's another change that I've seen over the past three or four years. Well, one question I had, too, are there different types of people who are buying it, or institutions, rather, that are getting into ETFs, given that we're seeing the innovation and products start to broaden out? Yeah, absolutely. So I'd say 70 percent of the ETF ownership is advisors. That's like the core market. They love ETFs. But institutions are about 10%. And then do-it-yourself retail, whatever the remainder is, would be the retail. That's growing. I think do-it-yourself retail is probably the highest growing area. Institutions tend to use only very highly liquid ETFs. Over time, though, I think they'll evolve as mid- and small-sized institutions sort of like stop the Yale model and look towards more like a Vanguard model to save costs. I think you will see some applications there. The bigger CalPERS type uh, institutions, they're always going to go with private equity and the Yale model type stuff. Um, but advisors, heart and soul, always will be. And the big reason they're so into ETFs is they change the way they get paid. They used to get paid getting a commission from the mutual fund. Now they get paid as a percentage of the client assets. That's called the fee-based model. Anywhere in the world where the fee-based model is growing, you'll see ETFs growing because now the advisors are more cost conscious because it comes out of their pocket now too. And that's really an underrated point in what's driving all the flows to ETFs. Absolutely. We started with spot Bitcoin ETF. That's obviously a big theme for investors as they look to figure out their allocations and their model portfolios. Also, AI, top of mind as well, uh, and Ozempic. What are the other big investing themes that are out there right now? It's funny you mentioned AI. I've heard it twice already. But, you know, there's not a ton of flows into AI thematic ETFs. But AI, I think, is going to be used more and more to assist how active does its job. And active is a huge growth area. So I think that is where we're going to see AI. And I do think that's an, um, an ongoing theme we'll see for the next five years. Now, AI thematic 
AI thematic ETFs, not a big deal, but AI used in active, I think will be a big deal. Eric Balchunas of Bloomberg Intelligence. Enjoy the conference and enjoy Miami while you can. Thank you. Still ahead, we drill down into commodity ETFs with Robert Minter of Aberdeen. Stick with us. This is ETF IQ on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Shanali Basak along with Scarlett Phil. It's time for today's drill down where we focus on one ETF. And normally Eric does this, but I'm going to take over for the day. We're going to start with BCI. This is the Aberdeen Bloomberg All Commodity Strategy K1 Free ETF. It's designed to track the Bloomberg Commodity Index, which is down about 1.8% so far this year and actually hovering near two year lows. So this is a passive fund. You can see actively managed, no. And as a result, its fees reflect that 25 basis point expense ratio. This fund has about 785 million dollars in assets. Let's take a look at the holdings, change up the screen here. As I mentioned, the fund tracks a Bloomberg Commodity Index, but it combines that with the return of three-month Treasury bills. So you'll see a lot of Treasury bills sprinkled into the holdings here. Um, and you'll also see a lot of bunch of commodities, futures contracts in the metal, agriculture, and energy space. We're talking zinc, for instance, cotton, wheat. There's heating oil as well. So a lot of mixes here of the Commodity Index, Chanali, that really uh, gives you a full picture of the commodity complex. Certainly a lot to think about across the complex. Thank you, Scarlett. Joining us now to talk more about this ETF is Robert Minter, Director of ETF Investment Strategy at Aberdeen. Robert, I want to kind of hone in here and go right to gold. And the reason is, is because if you're in a year where the Bitcoin ETF has come out and you have a lot of investors pitching this as digital gold, what do you then make of the original gold ETF? Well, it's it's funny that we you know gold's been used for uh, uh, currency and, and as jewelry for 6,300 years, so it's no small wonder that we call Bitcoin digital gold and we don't call gold physical Bitcoin. So, um, but from from my perspective, I spent a large part of my career as a multi-asset portfolio manager where we pay attention to changing correlations and price drivers. So that makes gold one of the more interesting commodities over the last couple of years. There's been a structural, significant structural uptick in gold demand. And it, it really is price, price agnostic. And the reason is that central banks are diversifying their foreign exchange holdings away from the US dollar and US treasuries. It's not the death of the dollar, but even small percentage moves away from those treasuries and dollars into gold can make a big difference to the price of gold. And this just is an, as an example. Uh, I just was going to mention that foreign foreign central banks bought 1,081 tons of gold in 2022, 1,037 tons in 2023, and that just completely swamped the 650 tons of gold that ETF investors sold over the same time period. Yeah, period. that's some great context, and I appreciate your sharing that. This is a story that we've heard for a while now, um, central banks diversifying uh, away from the U.S. dollar, and China is kind of leading the way here. Do you see uh, a corresponding decline in exposure to treasuries as it amps up its gold purchases? Yes, we saw a 10% decline in treasuries in, um, that China held um, over the most recent data period. So, so, he, so yes, does that make a, a difference to the Treasury market? No, the Treasury market's huge. But if you take all of that money and put it into gold, uh, particularly if you're agnostic about the price you pay for that gold, um, it does make a difference. If you look at ticker BCD, the Aberdeen longer dated strategy related to commodities, yes, gold is number one in the holdings here. Uh, but you also have a large exposure to crude. How do you think about the volatility in energy prices right now as you're thinking about investing in a commodities portfolio within an ETF? So there's very few ways to get that type of geopolitical risk exposure in a in a portfolio right now, um, it's it's there's no geopolitical risk in the in the price of oil. There's um, we're getting more and more concentrated areas where we get our our oil from. 
over if you look over the last 50 years, the average demand increase per year is one and a half percent. That's really hard to to uh, to dent that demand increase every year. Um, you can get a global financial crisis or or something really significant to, to dent that demand. But we're we're just really nowhere near that with electric vehicle um, uptake, even in countries like Norway, they've been um, uh, where 90 percent of the new cars are are electric vehicles. All they did was really stall the demand increase. Um, so uh, we we see the energy transition as one of the largest yeah. projects mankind's ever undertaken. It's just it's going to be a long time. Yeah, as we've seen with uh, the slowdown in the adoption of EVs, certainly at the consumer level. Robert, thank you so much for joining us. Robert Minter of Aberdeen there. And before we go, we wanted to take a special look at another commodity ETF just in time for Valentine's Day. The Two Cream Sugar Fund trades under the ticker Cane. It focuses on a single commodity, and that is, you guessed it, sugar. Since the pandemic, prices have gradually risen and have recently climbed to about 25 cents a pound as the threat of dry weather could hurt next season's product. When it comes to chocolate, even though the price is near a record high, Bloomberg Intelligence says the Valentine's Day commodity is set to be even more expensive this year as sugar supply issues linger and weather patterns could worsen the cocoa deficit. Over the past few years, most commodities enjoyed high returns due to the surge in inflation, including cane, which had sweet returns of around 95% since 2020. Performing both the S&P 500 and the Bloomberg Commodity Index. Kane has almost $20 million in assets, and unlike many Valentine's Day gifts this year, it's very affordable, 29 basis points. Investors should beware of heartbreak. Kane gets a red light in the Bloomberg Intelligence traffic light system with warnings for alternative tax treatment and potential futures roll costs. All right, a classic commodity ETF in so many ways. Absolutely, the original commodity yes. is food. But, you know, there is another commodity, Bitcoin. Is it a commodity? Well, it's a that's currency. A, it's a debate, right? But digital gold, let's call it for the purposes of this show. Mm -hmm. The ETF is obviously creating a lot of love around it. Bitcoin hitting the first time since 2021, the $50,000 mark, if you could Keep believe it. Keep an eye on that. And, of course, watch crypto on Bloomberg as well. And because of President's Day next week, we're going to be back on Wednesday, February 21st. And if you just can't get enough of ETFs, a reminder that you can listen to Eric and Joel Weber on Trillions. It is their podcast that covers the industry. That does it for Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Scarlett Fu. I'm Shanali Basic. This is ETF IQ on Bloomberg.